Okay, so shall we start? Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's lecture, Crossing the World to Sleep with You, Chinese Script Poetry as World Literature. I am Abel Song Han, a PhD student in the Comparative Literature at Cornell University. This year, I am serving as the chair of GSSC, uh, the Graduate Student Steering Committee of the East Asia Program. Our goal is to facilitate interdisciplinary dialogues on East Asia related to topics within and beyond Cornell University. Professor Xu specializes in modern and contemporary Chinese literary, cultural, and visual studies, comparative literature, and Taiwan studies. His interdisciplinary research engages two significant turns in literary and cultural studies, namely the affective and the ethical, by foregrounding disability as a mode of critique. He is currently completing his first book project entitled Broken uh, Bodies as Agents, uh, Disability Aesthetics and the Politics in Modern Chinese Culture and Literature. For his work on global disability studies, he received the Irving K. Zola Award for Emerging Scholars uh, in Disability Studies in 2020. Professor Xu's approach to global China studies has been very important to GSSC uh, students' uh, intellectual trajectories uh, as we continue to cross disciplinary and geopolitical boundaries in our research. This semester, we are reading Professor Xu's research in two Cornell courses, Professor Nick Adamson's uh, course on literary structure and my freshman writing seminar on East-West literary relations. For us, Professor Xu's work is truly uh, motivational because he brings various methodological inquiries to the field of modern Chinese literature. His work continuously rethinks what is China, how to be modern, and what does literature mean in this era of hypermediality. I'm really grateful for this event. So after uh, Professor Xu's lecture, we will have a Q&A session. For people joining us on Zoom, you can type your question in the chat and we will uh, read your question. Uh, I would like to also thank Ms. Amela Ling and Mr. Josh Young from the East Asia Program for the kind coordination and departments of comparative literature and Asian studies and society for humanities for the co-sponsorship. Now, without further ado, uh, please join me to welcome Professor Han Ping Xu. Thank you, um, Song. And first, thanks to everyone for coming out to attend this um, event. I also want to thank everyone um, uh, who made this event possible, in particular Song and Emma, who have been amazing. And, and I'm very humbled by the level of hospi hospitality that you've um, shown. And um, last night I arrived at 1 a.m. or something, and I rented a car at the Syracuse um, International um, Airport and, and drove here. It was a wonderful moment, because as I was driving, apparently I was the only car. And all the, <laughs> all the foliages uh, along the street, they were falling, but it was very windy last night. And I was just driving among the falling foliages, and it was absolutely a very poetic image. And I used to um, live in New Hampshire and Vermont, so I, I really miss um, the foliage and the autumn color. And in California, we don't have much of that. I think it was Toni Morrison, um, Toni Morrison, who got her MA you know, in literature from Cornell. And at one point, I think she visited California, and she said that, in California, all the trees are always waiting for something. <laughs> but not quite there yet. So I feel um, very uh, delighted to be able to cross the country to be able to speak um, you know, with you and, and think about uh, a poet that I really, really um, feel very invested in. And now, um, the other way. Just hit got it. OK. Don't leave yeah. the meeting. Just hit got it. Yeah, we need to return to the cursor. Return to meeting. Because I can't no, no, see. No, no, got it. Got it. Got it. But there you go. OK. He's got it. So I can't move my slides. Mm. So the other day, I was just chatting with my colleague, and my colleague said, Yu Xiuhua jiushi yu bu jingren si bu xiu, ni de lun wen ti mu gen shang yi cheng rong. Apparently, she's saying that the title of my uh, talk, Crossing the World to Sleep with You, apparently was inspired by Yu Xiuhua's famous 
poem crossing the country to sleep with you. So I've elevated the scale uh, to the world. Sensationalism aside, but in this talk, I'm going to make a case for the importance of translating Shui into sleep with. And in so doing, I'm thinking about the politics and the ethics of world literature. And here I also put the uh, Chinese title out there, 通过大半个地球, Chu Xun. Now the subtitle is Chinese Crypt Poetry as World Literature. And Song was asking me to translate that into Chinese. Somehow I faced some difficulty in translating Chinese Crypt Poetry into um, English. And I consider that um, that's a very important question in thinking about crypt, you know, crypt theory. And I'm a, putting a quote out there by Robert uh, McCourt um, in his book, Crypt Theory. Um, many of you might be more familiar with queer theory. The word queer used to have derogative meaning, but queer study scholars and activists have reclaimed the term queer in order to you know, unmistakably register a sense of pride in their identity. And the same is being done to the word crip, um, as the quote here um, states, reversing cripples in activity. Crip as a reclaimed term has been used to, as a marker of proud and at times defined identification, resisting attempts to diminish or devalue disability or disabled people. And now queer um, has been translated widely into English, uh, into Chinese uh, as kuar, which is very um, similar to queer. Now, in queer st in crypt studies and in Asia, in Chinese-speaking um, world, they've been making an attempt to render this term in um, Chinese to no you know, success. And here are some of the choices that scholars in Asia have rendered, whether and there's no consensus yet on how to render into um, um, uh, Chinese uh, yet. In fact, I'm bringing this case of this documentary film, Crip Camp, and some of you might have watched this film, which was supported by Obama Foundation about the birth of this Crip Camp and how it gave rise to disability rights movement. And when this film was screened in Asia and being translated into English, um, into Chinese, and this is the version in Singapore. So they were not able to render crib in a, uh, in a way that does its justice to the um, ambivalent meaning of crib, and instead they translate it as zhang ai ge ming. And this is, I think, a big step compared with the um, a version that has been circulated in mainland China. They render it as, as tan qi ying di. As you know, tan qi has that medical uh, connotation to consider people with disability in a medical model. The word Z literally means disease and illness. Whereas the version in Singapore and now also in Taiwan, Zhang Ai means barrier. That is to reconsider disability not as an individualist medical issue, but about the accessibility of a world always being already inaccessible in order to consider disability in a social model. But in any event, I just want to put this slide out there in order for us to think about how theory travels across the world, how you know, using different terminology is able to um, help us reframe um, uh, such an identity as um, disability. And having um, uh, said that, I'm going to put a roadmap um, here uh, so that you can follow my uh, lecture. I think the lecture is going to be three parts. First, I want to introduce this poet, um, Yu Xiuhua. More importantly, I want to conceptualize her poetry as what I call a speech act, and in so doing, to tease out the ways in which her poetry crips um, uh, in, in important ways. And the second part, I'm thinking about when Yu Xiuhua's poetry is being translated into English and other languages as well, how do we render this performative account of poetry in another language? Here I'm advancing an account of translation as performance in order to really do enough justice to the rhetoricity of the poetic language. So the second part uh, will be me comparing multiple uh, different translations of her most famous poem, Crossing China to Sleep With You. And finally, um, I will conclude by thinking about what this means um, in terms of pedagogy. How do we arrive at a pedagogy of teaching translated world literature 
in a more ethical way. So this is the roadmap for my lecture today. But I would like to show a little video from Fan Jian's film, Still Tomorrow, that juxtaposed Yu Xiuhua's rise to fame with her fight for divorce. And this is just the trailer for the film. For those of you who haven't uh, read her poem or have no idea who this poet is, I hope this um, video can show you who this poet is as a person and also as a very um, um, important poet I consider in contemporary Chinese literature. So here's a very short clip. Sorry, due to technology, we're not able to hear the sound crack as well, but at least you get a, an <coughs> idea of um, Yu Xiuhua as a person. And so Yu Xiuhua rose to fame in 2014 when her poem, Crossing China to Sleep with You, or Chenguo Da Bango Zhongguo Chu Shui went viral. Problematically labeled as, quote, the brain damaged peasant poet, unquote, her triply marginalized identities as a disabled rural woman were sensationalized. Sensationalism precipitated by social media coalesced with poetry's cultural prestige, blending popular and high cultures and churning up a veritable national carnival. The rise of Yu Xiuhua as a cultural figure emblematizes the changing cultural politics and the shifting infrastructure of literary production and reception in China today. If the civic space of social media endorses and celebrates this desiring subject, state-sponsored medias remain nostalgic for the inspirational supercrip. I use the term inspirational supercrip to intentionally foreground what disability studies scholars call inspirational porn, which exploits disability as a narrative to inspire the able-bodied politic. Uh, public. Such a stock narrative often features disability as a story of misery and suffering. The ultimate overcoming of disability transformed the disabled figure into a heroic, inspiring supercrip. Audiovisual representations of Yu Xiuhua tend to exploit her body for spectatorship. In a CCTV program, for example, that features you, the iconic image of the Weiming Lake in Beijing University shines behind her. And this image you see here is her sitting by the Weiming Lake at Peking University. With Beijing University long admired for its glorious tradition in the humanities and art, the lake represents the highest possible level of education and literary achievement. Yu sits there quite elegantly by the lake reading her own poems. The prestige of the institution shines behind her, ver visually transforming this downtrodden peasant into a figure of prominence and inspiration. In Victor Turner's ter uh, terms, Yu Xiuhua's non-normative body unsettles the able-bodied audience, resulting in an affective crisis. Whenever publicized, she is unfailingly labeled as, quote, the brain-damaged peasant poet. Whenever Cutthroat economic development in China precipitates, precipitates a moral crisis. Poetry here becomes appropriated as a moral purifier. In a move to redress the sense of crisis, the community often exploits disability as a moral trope, interpolating you into a public ritual of disability performance. However, Yu's performative agency, I argue, lies in her refusal to be interpolated into the symbolic order 
by way of staging a speech act. In her public appearances, as Yu utters every word with the ultimate care and at her own pace, the audience witnesses her tremendous dignity and character. In other words, patho leads to ethos. Emotions as part of a moral sentiment help set up moral ground for Yu, earning her self-respect from the audience. Her public presence is powerful and persuasive. If Yu stops there at the level of pathos and ethos, however, her public presence is vulnerable to the charge of being objectified by the ableist gaze. Instead, she goes on to qualify herself as an excellent rhetorician by virtue of her logos. Due to her speech impairment, she, she tends to speak economically, but she's always spot on, precise, and sharp. During the televised talk shows, almost all the hosts tend to sensationalize her story and make her into an inspirational supercrit. Often anti-sensationalist, you would intervene, exclaiming, for example, there's nothing to be glorified about disability. It's not an easy life. The hostess from the Beijing TV station, for example, asked, how do you manage to write such beautiful poetry with your brain-damaged disability? Unquote. Yu raises her voice and said, cerebral palsy does not mean my brain is damaged. My brain is as good as yours, if not better. You should know this, so does the public. Unquote. The Shanghai Oriental TV station even put together a live show where several so-called experts fiercely debate in Yu's presence whether she is a good poet or not. A fellow poet, apparently jealous of her overnight success, confronts you saying, quote, you're a liar, an opportunist. Your poetry is full of base language. There are much better poets out there. For example, the migrant worker Xu Lichi writes about important questions such as death. He heroically committed suicide, unquote. Both angered and amused, Yu Shouha goes on to ridicule the fellow poet and said, I have no doubt in my mind that you have the ambition to become a great poet yourself. So when are you going to commit a suicide? Unquote. <laughs> Moments like this, um, in which Yu Shouhua sharply sabotages the dominant ideology of ability and sexism, abound in her public appearances. Having initially released their catharsis and being fooled by her vulnerability during her poetry reading, the audience at this point would now be taken aback by Yu's remade image that is eloquent, rebellious, and sharp. This image breaks with two stereotypical representations of the disabled figure. One, passive, weak, and apolitical. The other, heroic and forever loyal to the socialist state. The second stereotype of disability bears a genealogy that is traceable to Mao's China. I put some slides here. In which disabled heroes ep epitomize the exemplary revolutionary subject. When any cultural or political agent tries to recruit you into serving as a heroic socialist subject, she rebels, rebels against the interpolation. Her discursive control of her personal narrative is significant. When all the powerful forces simultaneously from the state, society, and market operate around her with great authority, Yu Shouhua exercises her linguistic agency with wit, force, resilience, and rhetorical sagacity. Her public presence is at once interventionist and pedagogically instructive for the public. <coughs> As Tobin <coughs> Sievers puts it, a disability studies scholar puts it, quote, the level of literacy about disability is so low as to be non-existent, and the ideology of ability is so much part of every action, thought, judgment, and intention that its hold on us is difficult to root out, unquote. Yu Shouhua challenges the state-mandated image of persons with disability by her individualist self-representation, performing much-needed cultural work in eroding social stigmas of disability. Her widely tweeted poem, Crossing China to Sleep with You, is that performative speech act par excellence, as I will argue in this paper. I put um, uh, my own and um, my co-translator Huerta's translation there for those of you who haven't read the poem because um, basically I'm going to do a very close reading of the poem. So I thought it's important for you to see the text here. Maybe I'll just read this so that you get an idea of this 
uh, Kong, crossing over half of China to sleep with you. In fact, to take you or to be taken by you are basically the same. Nothing more than the force of two bodies colliding and a flower opened by that force. Nothing more than a spring simulated by the flower. And this we mistake as rebirth. Across half of China, things are happening. Volcanoes erupt, rivers dry, forgotten political <coughs> prisoners and migrant workers, guns trained on elk deer and red chrome cranes. I cross the storm of bullets to sleep with you. I press countless nights into one dawn to sleep with you. I run countless me into one to sleep with you. Of course, I too can be led astray by butterflies, mistake praise as spring, or a village similar to Kandian as home. But all these are absolute reasons that I go and sleep with you. And here is the Chinese um, version. So how do we then, in translation, account for this transmedia performance of Yu's poetic display? If the new media ecology has radically altered the notion of textuality, further destabilizing its hermeneutic apparatus, what liberties can a translator take in re-rendering a poem in a way that recaptures the cultural event in which a poem like Crossing was received? How do we how do particular translations capture texts as performative utterances rather than rendering them as static entities? What are the ethics of this of translation? In this talk, I compare different English translations of this provocative poem in order to examine the translator's cultural and linguistic mediation. And now this is one of the poems that have been <coughs> translated by different people. I'm just putting um, several different renderings out there. And the most important thing that uh, make these translations different is how to render the Chinese term shuini. And here, uh, a bunch of choices that people have put together, including the first one that was done by me and my co-translator. I consider translation as an interpretive performance positing a translator's relationship to the source text as akin to an actress' relationship to their script. Contextualizing Yu Xiuhua's rise as a poet and cultural figure, I suggest that a performative account of translation can be considered as a response to a changing notion of textuality in our transmedial ecology when publication, reception, and reading practices are radically reshaped. Treating translation as performance requires a move towards an understanding of poetry as not merely textual scripts, but also as performative processes of cultural practices with a focus on the performance of the poetic voice that is enabled by its tonal, affective, and narrative repertoire. I argue in this talk that Crossing the Poem is a highly performative poem and use it as a symptomatic text to evaluate used poetic language as a speech act which a translation seeks to perform in a foreign context. And then finally in this talk, I'll conclude with a reflection on world literature pedagogy, working toward a critical pedagogy of teaching translated literature. Indeed, this poem embodies hyper-translatability, that is, this poem enjoys multiple translations. These various translations differ in their rendering of Xuanyi, the Chinese characters. I suggest that the poem's cultural work lies precisely in the playful wording of Xun. Here on the slide, you can see these various renderings of Xun. Although Xun literally means to sleep with you, the Chinese and English terms simp uh, imply different power dynamics. The Chinese discourse of Xun, which differs significantly from Huni Shui, inherently evokes a subject-object power relation. It is normally uttered by a desiring man, Wo xiang xun, I want to xun. Unlike the English phrase to sleep with, shui in this vernacular use is not a, a prepositional -prop verb. To sleep with in English, however, does not evoke that strong hierarchy of gender power, I want to sleep with you. That is why Ming Di's translation, as you see here, to sleep with you or to be slept is rather awkward. The fact that to sleep with does not enjoy a passive verb form in English grammar 
suggests that it does not assume that strong subject-object power relationship. It is perhaps the more egalitarian lexicon for describing sex. Another version, Li Dian's version that you see on the slide, misses the opportunity to use the powerful verb shui altogether by rendering it as sex is almost the same, being the top or the bottom, which is kind of a queer <laughs> vocabulary. <laughs> How about a more poetic addiction, <laughs> such as what you see here, uh, Ye Ru Gang's uh, version, bedding you and being bedded by you, uh -huh. while this choice emanates a more literary, formal, or even Shakespearean, uh, Shakespearean <laughs> fanfare, I argue it fails to encapsulate the tone of the chi Chinese original. The opening utterance of this sub subversive poem should be rendered forcefully and trans. Um, transgressively, because it is an um, argumentative line that explicitly discusses the subject-object dynamic of sex and subverts the gender power dynamic. As you see, this is the first mm. stanza. As such, I suggest that it calls for a more powerful verb, such as take, or the F word, fuck, although I shall argue later that the F word undermines the lyrical aspects of sexuality that the speaker establishes throughout the, uh, the poem. Now the question of subject-object power relationships brings to the fore the debate over the language of penetration among queer feminist scholars. The phallus is not just a biological embodiment of manhood, but is over time endowed with symbolic meaning, which undergirds the ideology of patriarchy. Penetration is, I quote, the phallic act par excellence, unquote, as Joan Rake puts it. In psychoanalysis, the discourse of the phallus has a troubled history. Lacan, for example, concludes, and I quote, woman does not exist, unquote, because the phallus is the signifier that the symbolic order dictates in order to determine who constitutes as the masculine subject. In summary, feminist and post-structuralist theories conceptualize the phallus not just as a physical object, but rather as a symbolic language that structures the marking of gender and the discursive construction of the masculine subject. The feminine, as Judy Lee Butler famous <coughs> puts it, and I quote, is never a mark of the subject. Rather, the feminine is the signification of lack, signified by the symbolic, a set of differentiating <coughs> linguistic rules that effectively create sexual difference, unquote. In the Chinese language, the discourse of shui is a gendered one. The masculine subject <coughs> utters the language of I want to shui as a way of asserting sexual power, evoking an effect of dominion. To counter the symbolic order, the feminine subject of this poem, I argue, enunciates a speech act that violates the normative gender expectations. It is precisely by troubling the power asymmetry of <coughs> sex that the speaker of Yu's poem rewrites the traditional script of woman as passive. To the extent that the speaker cracks open the masculine subject for critical interrogation, the poem's performative enunciation enjoyed an epic national scale in the context of the poem's crazed circulation in the Chinese media scape. I emphasize the significance of the figure of this female speaker crossing China to initiate a sex ritual in the manner of Jude O'Beller's queer feminist analysis of the play Antigone. Antigone's agency, according to Butler, is demonstrated by her, quote, linguistic assertion. She uses language to claim her deed, unquote. And her linguistic performativity is her appropriation of, quote, the very language of the state against which she rebel, rebels, unquote. If Antigone, quote, puts the regimes of representation into crisis and raises the question of what the conditions of intelligibility could have been that would have made her life possible, unquote, the speaker of this poem, I argue, performs a similar speech act, thereby appropriating the masculine term of shun and precipitating a representational crisis. Let us dwell on this first stanza a little bit further. As you can see here, there are two different translations that I juxtapose here. 
These, translation, these two translations um, are um, mainly what I compare in this um, paper, one by uh, De Lorraine's translation, the other by, one by uh, Huerta and myself. After the opening line disavows the subject-object relations, we have the juxtaposition of images and concepts. Sex is no more than a force, a, bl a blossoming flower, a fictional spring, and a renewed life. The word colliding or peng zhuang, as you see here, avoids the gender language of dominion, penetration, and passivity. However, the irony of the first stanza stems from the speaker's realization that this renewed life force is mere illusion and that this spring is simulated and even fictional. It simultaneously stages a feminist inversion and trivialization of clinical sex. By confronting the symbolic order head on, the speaker in this poem strikes a counter statement to Lacan's um, woman does not exist a pronouncement, not only loudly announcing I am here, but also calling into question the very language by which the marking of gender materializes and even pointing out the illusion and vanity of that power apparatus. Here, however, the speaker's tone in the first stanza is strategically tentative. Um, the Lorraine's English translation of the opening line here leaves us out the Chinese phrase qi shi, meaning in fact or actually. Why does a poem start with uh, a function word such as in fact? I suggest that this function word, which is followed by a comma that invites the reader to pause and reflect, is significant to the tonal progression and the manipulation of the poem. The speaker begins her poetic argumentation from a standpoint of negotiation. The insertion of in fact diplomatically tones down the voice of a contrarian speaker who will increasingly become assertive throughout the poem as the poem builds up. Without this tonal adjust, uh, adjuster to soften the initial aggressivity, um, to Lalonde's opening translation as a declarative sentence that is fucking you and being fucked by you are quite the same, I argue, fails to register the speaker's playful and tactful negotiation with the symbolic order. This is the second um, stanza. The second stanza stages a sudden shift from sex to the nation at large. The evocation of the nation in this stanza and in the poem's title, indeed, played a crucial role in the poem's sensational reception, striking a nerve in the national psyche. In a nationalistic culture, there is an epic yearning to function as China's signifier. You use, uh, usually avoids writing about grand narratives, yet in this unusual <coughs> poem, she takes on national issues such as national disaster and political uh, incarceration. This stanza about the precarious situation of the nation when juxtaposed with sex, reinforces the submissive, uh, subversive effect achieved in the opening stanza. Yu's poetic voice is transgressive in its subordinate, subordination of high politics and matters of national concern to her own daily existence, flirting with national politics that are indexed, but only significant in the sense that they impact the poetic subject's physical and emotional world. On the other hand, the installation of disturbing images here in the second stanza paints a vivid picture of a nation in trouble, one that is plagued by political unrest, economic degradation, and ecological disaster. The sense of immediacy and presentness conveyed by the Chinese word zai, on the other hand, prepares for the speaker's radical journey in the following stanza, traversing the precarious national landscape both physically and metaphorically fired by a burning desire for sexual intimacy. However, the repetitive use of fuck in uh, Zhu Lorraine's translation in this stanza as you see here is an over-translation that undermines the complex poetic uh, voice of the poem as well as its articulation <coughs> of sexual politics. After the previous stanza, uh, the epic evocation of the nation, uh, crossing the nation to sleep with you. This stanza you see here shifts its register to a more lyrical voice. 
the speaker continues to assert her a active agency in the sex ritual. In this three line stanza, this active sense of agency is achieved through a combination of argumentation, um, narration, and rich imagery. Argumentation <coughs> is conveyed um, uh, by the syntactical structure of the emphasis with which the speaker conveys her effort to the imagined you. The narration of this journey is further vivified by the images of bullets, night, and dawn. In her direct address to you, the speaker delivers a sense of intimacy, connection, and yearning. This romantic and lyrical aspect of sexuality in Yu Xiuhua's poetry is essential for conveying her bold, introspective ruminations on the role of sex in romantic relationships and of the relationship between the individual and the nation. However, rendering this stanza with three um, fucks, one after another, tends to degrade this increasingly earnest speaker. The articulated connection between the speaker and you to whom she travels is lost in such a crude word choice. A parallelism of fuck sounds as if the speaker did not care about you, as if it were a casual hookup. The acoustic quality of the F word uttered three times at once grinds on the ear, sounding crass if not downright lewd, establishing awkward contrast with the otherwise poetic tone of this stanza and of the entire poem. Yet the Chinese word shui, due to its ambiguity, does not achieve the effect of fuck. I therefore submit that shui in the first stanza, which we discussed, should be rendered forcefully in English as take or something to this effect with sexual connotation in order to immediately establish the speaker's rumination on the gendered powers of sex. Yet the rest of the poem, which has a, a lyrical quality to it as it advances a more egalitarian narrative of sex and gender should be better served with the English translation of To Sleep With You, including the title of the poem, which I argue evokes that more egalitarian power structure out there. Here we come the concluding um, stanza. These concluding lines brings the poem even closer to the construction of a lyrical subjectivity by expressing the speaker's vulnerability during the journey, as you see here. From the culturally charged <coughs> trope of the butterfly, the reader might recall the iconic dream of the butterfly tale from Zhuangzi. In a dream, Zhuangzhou metamorphorizes into a butterfly. As he awakens, his memory of the butterfly brings him to a state of delirium and self-doubt with which the liminal boundaries between reality and illusion <coughs> are blurred. As if this ordeal was a dream, the speaker in this stanza, her poetic journey crosses the country, undergoes detour and misled path, which induces confusion and illusion. The motif of spring and the theme of illusion bring the reader in a full circle back to the opening stanza in which the speaker muses about the illusion of power in the sex act. Moreover, this illusionary epiphany triggers the speaker's sense of ontological homelessness. She mistakes a random village across the journey as her hometown Hengdian, which is also Yu Xiuhua's biological hometown. What is striking and in fact baffling is the fact that uh, Zi Lorian's translation leaves us out the last two lines of the poem. In this highly mediation-saturated world, the notion of stable textuality has already been caught into question. As one of the most widely circulated poems in Chinese literary history, Crossing has secured numerous incarnations. However, all the available and searchable versions of this poem include the last two lines that um, Zi Lauren took the liberty to abandon. Her rendering um, in this translation reads, and I think of some odes as spring, unquote. Here, her choice of ode, namely a lyric poem, 
is very interesting. Of course, you know, this genre enjoys a venerable tradition of Greek origin. It, I argue, gives used poem an unnecessarily elevated tone. It taps into or panders into the English reader's cultural imagination of or reference to the elevated subject. More importantly, the last line, which in effect constitutes the last stanza of the poem, vanishes in her translation. But all, uh, but these are all absolute reasons that I go and sleep with you. Now, this plain line of declaration, I argue, is, is a significant figure of speech to the rhetoricity of the poem. Here, Yu's poetic performance comes a full circle by striking a confessional, chatty, or even essayistic tone. It reads like a concluding line of a persuasive essay. I began my analysis of this poem by pointing out the argumentative, chatty tone of the first stanza, that is, in fact, to take you or to be taken by you are basically the same. The poetic closure of this text in this last line is faithful in tone to the <coughs> establishing stanza. The speaker not only speaks a lyrical, poetical language, but also blends poetics with an argumentative discourse to perform her speech act, directly addressing you. Yu Xiuhua's poetry, having been circulating beyond Chinese borders thanks to its numerous translations into English and probably other languages, is a worthy candidate for an anthology of world literature, a course syllabi, or a general theorization of world literature in an increasingly transmediated world. As the field of world literature seeks to expand its textual archive and theoretical horizon beyond the Euro-American context, critical intersectional and identity-based studies of literature and culture in North America will likely welcome Yu Xiuhua's poetry to be read in the context of her rise as a triply marginalized poet combating the ideologies of ableism, sexism, and classicism. As David Penn puts um, it here in this quote, the idea of world literature began then as an evolution in the US teaching curricula that followed domestic, democratic, and political trends. As a product of US political and cultural power, the discourse of world literature continues to present a view of the world from the US perspective, and the canon world literature continues to be defined by the particular historical and political uh, exigencies of um, high American higher education. And here, Penn's um, is a realist account of world literature under the guise of nationalist, if not imperialist, imagination. Expanding our conceptualization of world literature beyond ethnography or domestic politics, however, requires a formalist, culturalist, and performative approach to translation, which brings our interpretive faculties to bear upon diverse and sometimes competing translations, an approach which aspires to, as Huang Yintou puts it, quote, question the very possibility of translation and to recognize fully the intertextual, intercultural nature of trans-Pacific displacement, unquote. In this light, Stephen Oven's famous um, article and his concern about contemporary Chinese poetry's translatability uh -huh. might become irrelevant because this comparative approach to translating and reading world poetry demythifies the singularity of a text and shatters its pretenses of transparency, instead inviting us to truly practice the closest possible reading. Cat um, cataloging multiple translations of the same text and cross-analyzing the formal and performative tension that they present us will enrich our reading experience and enables us to reach a more ethical reading practice. Let me conclude by revisiting um, Spivak's um, important um, essay, The Politics of Translation, which addresses the ethics and politics of translation from a feminist and post-colonial point of view. Spivak here in this quote suggests that a translator does not strive for a one-on-one -on -one correspondence because meaning is always already deferred, dispersed, and multiplied. 
meaning rests upon the performative, what you call, rhetoricity of the original. <coughs> I suggest that such rhetoricity can be better reached through a cross-examination of various translations of the same poem as I have done in this talk. I hope that this paper has advanced and demonstrated um, a reading practice that places different translations alongside each other in order to take stock of the poem's inseparable formal and cultural materiality. This reading practice seeks to broaden or thicken the context in which we read different translations, not only relating them back to the Chinese context in its specificity, but also to the specific transnational code switching that renders a particular translation intelligible in the target language. Such an approach grounds our culturalist interests firmly within the formal materiality of language by cross-analyzing the various translational afterlives of the original and discerning the inscriptions of power in such literary world making. My comparative approach to translation seeks to perform and re-render one single poem's speech act by inviting multiple translated texts into an intertextual dialogue and utilizing the tension that derives from such a hermeneutic exercise to interrogate mm. the rhetoricity of language as well as illuminate the contextual and political conditions of our cross-cultural interpretive effort. This reading practice can perhaps help steer toward a critical pedagogy of translated literature. Our undergraduate or even graduate courses designed with a broad comparative <coughs> focus inevitably teach texts in translation since one can never assume that all students will share the same linguistic expertise. So how do we discuss translated materials as translation? Can we perform close and critical readings of translations as if they were original? And if so, how? Above all, how do we encounter and embody these translations when they cross the world to sleep with us? Thank you for listening. <laughs> and you might be interested in more um, poetry by Yu Shouhua. Here, just one line that I uh, took from another poem by Yi Shouhua, mm -hmm. simply titled, I Love You, which I really like. I, would just, I guess I'll just conclude by reading this particular stanza from that poem titled, I Love You. In a tidy yard, I read your poems. In this world, love is hazy, no different from a sparrow's sudden passing. But time is bright and clear. I'm not fit for heartbreak. So... Thank you again. Thank you.